Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Clarifying the Development and Implementation of Molecular Tests in the Clinical Laboratory. My name is Claire Wu from Thermo Fisher Scientific. I'm a Senior Region Market, uh, Market Development Manager of Asia Pacific Region in Genetic Testing Solutions team. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. I encourage you to participate by submitting any questions that you may have for our speakers during the presentation. To do so, simply type your question into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will have a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we will try to answer as many of the questions as time allows. Any questions that we cannot get to will be responded via the Q&A box or email. You may also submit any technical issues in the chat box if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. Now, I would like to hand over the time to one of our speaker, Mara Espinol from the Health Catalyst Group, who will provide an introduction of the speakers and our presentation. Mara, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And it is wonderful to be here and to be with all of you. And we have a very important topic this morning, but with a fun title, the simple, sensible, sal salient, and spellbinding seven questions about laboratory developed tests. And we have fantastic speakers. But first, let me share with you the um, disclaimer from Thermo Fisher Scientific, our sponsor for today. We're very grateful for Thermo Fisher Scientific for making this event possible. So when we talk about our event today, it uh, we have four learning objectives, describing the different types of in vitro diagnostic tests, the differences between in vitro diagnostic tests, often called IVDs, and laboratory developed tests called LDTs, to list the benefits of running both the IVD and LDT and explain how they are designed and regulated in the US. There are many parallels between the US and Asia and other countries around the world, but we want to root our discussion today to talk about how it's done in the US. So to do that, um, we have um, some great speakers. I'll start by just briefly introducing myself. As you heard, Mara Aspinall, and I'm. my career has been based in the business of clinical diagnostics. I had the privilege of serving as president of Genzyme Genetics and CEO of Roche Tissue Diagnostics. I have um, worked on large companies and small companies and right now uh, run a venture capital firm investing in diagnostics. Um, but probably the biggest privilege of my life is to be the co-founder of the School of Biomedical Diagnostics at Arizona State University. And um, with that, we teach the business science and technology of the uh, of diagnostics broadly, both in the US and around the world. But I'm only a small piece of this. Today, we have two fantastic speakers who are the great leaders in the diagnostics industry. First, uh, you will hear from Dr. Marilyn Owens. Marilyn is a senior healthcare executive with over 40 years of extensive management experience, both establishing and leading clinical reference laboratories. She has had that experience in academic, academic medical centers as well as private and hospital labs. She has a broad scientific background in immunology, infectious disease, oncology, genetics, and molecular biology, um, and quite frankly, much more. Marilyn has substantial lab operating experience across the globe in Asia, in Europe, and certainly in the US. She's always had PL responsibility with both large and small labs. And her expertise spans startups, strategic planning, and mergers and acquisitions, again, for the labs and the hospital systems that she's worked with. Marilyn is an experienced teacher, mentor, and coach with graduate training in both business and life sciences. Our second speaker today is Dr. Michael Donovan. 
And Michael is also an outstanding leader. He has been a registered patent attorney specializing in patent prosecution and intellectual property licensing and commercialization for life science related technologies, a critical field. He has an academic background in microbiology and a PhD in immunology. After leaving private practice, Michael worked as the intellectual property counsel for the Translational Genomics Research Institute and recently served as the system director for intellectual property at Common Spirit Health. Today, Michael is a lecturer in the Arizona State University Biomedical Diagnostics Program, where he teaches a variety of areas, including regulatory law, health economics, and bioethics. And Michael was just appointed the director of the program. So we are thrilled to have these two great speakers with us today. And with that, I'm very pleased to hand it over to you, Marilyn. Thank you, Maura. I had to find the right control. So uh, the agenda today uh, is really following the very provocative title of this seminar with the, the, the seven questions. And so uh, we were going to try to answer all seven of those questions in the order of this agenda. The basics of diagnostic test terminology so that we're all talking about the same things. And then what is a laboratory developed test? And how does it compare to an in vitro diagnostic test? Why use LDTs or why use IVDs? Who uses LDTs and who uses IVDs? When can I develop these tests? How do LDTs compare to IVDs? And importantly, how can a lab protect their intellectual properties? In this slide, we'll talk about test terminology. In vivo, which is in the body, there are lots of tests that are done in vivo. Physiology, we have EKGs, we have blood pressures. In radiology, there are x-rays, CT, and other imaging uh, techniques, MRIs, and PET scans. But the technology in the in vivo test is driven by physicians. The physician is there with the patient doing the in vivo assessments. In the laboratory, we're doing in vitro, which means we are doing them outside of the body in test tubes, in culture plates, in uh, microtiter plates, a variety of different uh, holders, but the testing is outside of the body. The IVDs are tests performed on body fluids that are, are uh, actually both the IVDs and the LDTs are performed on body fluids taken from the body or cells taken from the body or tissues taken from the body. Both IVDs and LDTs detect and quantify levels of desired biomarkers, which can be enzymes, proteins, nucleic acids, to diagnose and uh, determine the body's function and disorders. Now the difference is in IVDs, technology is driven by products from simple to complex, the simple chemistries to the complex flow cytometries. In LDTs, technology is driven by the process that you use to do the test. As we talk about comparison between IVDs and LDTs, the differences are IVDs are developed by vendors for sale to diagnostic laboratories, health clinics, or consumers. LDTs can be developed by individual laboratories, but are not transferred 
licensed or sold. With rare exception, Michael can answer those questions. In IVDs, they're registered with the FDA. There's standardized instrument qualification procedures and training is required to perform the test exactly as it's specified. The LDTs, however, require uh, training and qualification established by the individual laboratory that has designed the LDT. The IVDs use uh, must be pre-validated with data analysis and bioinformatics reports. That's done by the vendor. But the LDTs developed in-house are developed mostly by necessity. And there's not a standard assay that was uh, available to compare to. IVD tests must be clinically validated. That's extremely important. LDTs must be clinically verified and can be implemented quickly for emergency use. They must be compliant with the regulations of your laboratory, of course, but they can be developed faster. There are a wide variety of assays for different applications. And it, the molecular uh, testing really has a, a huge number of opportunities. Obviously, respiratory pathogens like the COVID pandemic that we are still in. You can uh, have molecular tests for specific genes and proteins linked to rare diseases. You can do genetic variants. You can have metabolites pathogens, oncology markers, and now even more, you can have pharmacogenomic markers, which help to determine whether or not an individual can take a, a certain medication and have it be effective within their bodies. There are a number of reasons for using an IVD. In fact, the main reason is the vendor has done all the heavy lifting. In order to use a test clinically, it needs to have been proven that it works. And you have to have a supply of the reagents and the equipment that you need to do that test. That means that there's supply chain that's taken on by the vendor. You have design controls that they have done in their manufacturing process. It's easier to establish an IVD as a gold standard because it's had FDA or other regulatory approval. It has to have adverse report event reporting in order to uh, pass the regulatory approvals. And of course, in the process of producing an IVD, it has to have manufacturing controls and most importantly, a complete clinical validation prior to marketing. That is the way that the clinical validity is uh, enforced and documented. Why would you do an, I, an LDT if you could go uh, to a vendor and pull a kit off the shelf? Well, there may not be a kit for what you want to measure. That's the main reason. And th the, the second reason would be that you can't scale up an IVD test for your desired throughput. For example, if you wanted to go fully automated and the test kits were only of a certain size, you may want to do a home brew so that you could uh, expand the capability of your testing using an LDT. An LDT could be an improvement over an existing assay, but because you've changed what the IVD had, it has to be validated by you. So therefore it becomes an LDT. If an LDT uh, is developed in your laboratory, it takes less time than it does take a manufacturer to go through all of their manufacturing controls, all of their verification testing, as well as their clinical utility validation. An LDT can help a laboratory remain competitive. That's another reason for doing your own thing is to tailor make your testing for your physician audience. 
Advantages of IVDs. Certainly in quality systems, you have the built-in uh, requirements, including the design controls and manufacturing controls. All, all the heavy lifting, as I said, has been done by the vendors. Inventory control is simple. Uh, you simply ask for an additional kit or an additional vial of a certain reagent. You don't have to manufacture it yourself. The technical support is there and you can contact them to troubleshoot and replace any products that didn't work as you believe they should. The clinical validity is a big part of IVDs. The evaluation of the test ensures that it detects or me measured the specified target or it's used in determining the presence or absence of a clinical condition or predisposition. So clinical validity is a great advantage of an IVD. The broad distribution of IVDs means that it's out there in the market and many laboratories would be using it. It means that you can compare results. You can report proficiency uh, test results to confirm the accuracy of the test by exchanges between laboratories. Now we look at the advantages of LDTs. Uh, the advantage, the main advantage for doing an LDT is that you control what you're going to be measuring. You, you can specifically uh, select relevant targets and applications for your needs. You can rapidly adapt it. You can be, uh, you can develop and then modify it relatively quickly to respond to market needs or changes in the clinical situations. It's generally a lower cost per test because you're, you're not paying for the overhead of the manufacturing processes. It's consolidation into a single test, and that's with multiple analytes. I think that we'll, we'll talk a bit later about uh, multiplexing and singleplexing for especially molecular testing, but that allows you to get more data from a single sample and may enable a faster diagnosis as well. The laboratory qualification of uh, the quality management systems required by all clinical laboratories cover the qualifications for LDTs, but it's not the case for the IVD kit production. So I'm going to go through just this one complex slide before Michael talks uh, about the next area. And that's because the, the typical LDT process from planning to launch is uh, it's a whole research project in its own right. And uh, I, I believe that those of you who have developed LDTs will agree with me on this, that you, you cannot do enough planning to make sure that that you get through all of these steps in the and particularly in the the logical order to save time so first of all do you have a certified lab are you required to have a licensure in your area and if so uh, are you ready to go are, you have to plan for running an ldt which would be there's no other test you have what you need to to do uh, the test in terms of equipment, staffing, space, et cetera. Is it a test or a panel? What targets will you have? How will you interpret the results? You have to do an analytical validation to prove that the clinical testing works. And that means that you have to go through specific areas of sensitivity, specificity, reproducibility, accuracy, and then the interfering substances don't affect your results. You have to have a clinical verification, which means you have to run some clinical samples to be sure that you can measure what you want to measure in patients, not just in contrived samples. However, you don't have to do a clinical utility study as the uh, IVDs need to do. When you launch the test, this is your marketing. You should have already been working with your uh, providers 
who would be interested in this test and engage them to be advocates for your laboratory and the test that you plan to offer. If possible, you should publish peer-reviewed papers utilizing your test because that drives its own marketing. So now I'm going to turn over the controls to Michael and he's going to start with regulation. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, thank you for that great introduction in terms of IVDs and LDTs. Um, as Marilyn just mentioned, we are now going to talk about regulation. Um, and one thing that I really want you to, to, to remember as we talk about this is IVDs are more product driven. Um, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration or FDA um, regulates things. You can think about it in, in terms of tangible goods. LDTs, on the other hand, again, are process driven. Um, you can think of them as, as akin to the, the practice of medicine as opposed to these tangible goods that the FDA actually regulates. So IVDs are regulated by the FDA so long as they fall within the FDA's um, mandate, which is described here. Um, basically, diagnostics include, again, tangible items, things like reagents, instruments, and systems that are intended for the use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions. The FDA has this mandate and uh, in terms of regulating diagnostics, uh, but this, this mandate actually falls under the larger heading of medical devices. So the FDA regulates diagnostics as medical devices. So the class one, class two, and class three um, requirements and the associated regulatory burdens associate, uh, tied in with those classes play a big role. So because we're regulating as medical devices, there are mainly two, two ways that, that, that a, um, a diagnostic can get to market through the IVD pathway which is either pre-market authorization, uh, which is when you have something that's basically a completely new diagnostic without a predicate, um, that can take multiple years and quite frankly, millions of dollars to get through in order to demonstrate uh, safety and efficacy of the test. Um, and those terms are generic because again, uh, diagnostics are regulated as a device. On the other hand, if there is a similar device or a similar diagnostic out there, maybe you've come up with a, a new ELISA or a new RT-PCR kit um, that, that can detect based on a new biomarker um, or maybe a, a new SNP that's been detected, um, you have the potential to go through the 510K pathway. This is much more abbreviated, takes less time and costs less um, uh, resources uh, in order to, to reach the clearance stage. Um, now, with respect to uh, IVDs that are not yet approved or cleared by the FDA, there is an opportunity for manufacturers uh, to generate some kind of revenue, but that is only uh, in the context of research use only or investigational use only um, uh, uh, potential uses for that diagnostic. However, that is um, uh, that does require proper labeling to make sure that the consuming public, um, these clinical laboratories, as well as potentially research laboratories, refrain from using these types of devices, um, uh, in refrain from using them as clinical diagnostic procedures. And then finally, the FDA has this alternative pathway in the case of uh, public health emergencies, the emergency use authoriz authorization pathway. This provides expedited review and, and clearance of tests that are, are, are designed to address that, that public health need. Obviously, we saw this with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but interestingly enough, just today, we actually saw um, a few uh, monkeypox tests that cleared uh, emergency use authorization pathway uh, at the FDA. I think there's four or five um, uh, cleared, cleared tests at this point. Now, on the other hand, LDTs, remember an LDT uh, is, a, is, an, is a diagnostic test, but it is designed, manufactured, and used within a single clinical laboratory. Now, the FDA, and this is a point of contention, the FDA claims that it could regulate LDTs if it wants to, but it is exercising enforcement discretion and basically punting the, the, the regulation of these diagnostic tests to other key stakeholders. So under the, the 1988 CLIA amendments, um, which is a, a federal law here in the U.S., 
um, all laboratories that test patient specimens must obtain a certificate of compliance or accreditation in order to bill CMS. And it is a combination of CMS as well as um, uh, state regulators, individual state regulators um, that do carry out a fair amount of the regulation for LDTs. Um, LDTs um, and also uh, IVDs as well, tests in general are categorized, categorized into different levels of complexity. And we're actually going to look at that on the next slide. Um, and as I mentioned before, there is uh, some controversy, some disagreement in terms of the FDA's regulatory authority, but this was even made more in, uh, challenging to grasp uh, back in 2020 when um, the Trump administration, uh, through the Health and Human Services um, uh, Department, basically came out and said, FDA does not have the authority to regulate uh, or to require emergency use authorization for COVID tests, for, for a COVID L LDT test. Well, then uh, a little bit more than a year later in November, 2021, um, with a new administration, that new administration came out and said, no, um, FDA does have that authority and FDA will in fact require EUAs for uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, LDTs. So it is, it is an ongoing, uh, very murky area and interestingly enough, hopefully we'll get some clarity uh, with respect to the potential valid act that's slowly making its way through the, the halls of Congress. Now, as I mentioned, there is this, this component of text, test complexity. Um, now the FDA, uh, there's a lots of controversy in terms of their role with LDTs, but this is an area where there is not controversy. Uh, the FDA has the authority to make a determination whether um, a diagnostic test into which category that diagnostic test falls. And that category then determines what level of CLIA, um, cert, uh, CLIA certification is required for that clinical laboratory. And there are three major categories. There's wave tests, uh, which are simple to, form, simple to perform. There's very low risk of interpretation error and potentially there is, is relatively little clinical significance. Um, many of these tests are actually sold over the counter such that consumers can use them at home. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if they're run in the lab, there still needs to be a, um, uh, um, a CLIA certificate for uh, a CLIA waiver certificate. Um, as I said, this, these are relatively simple tests, pregnancy tests, strep tests, glucometers, um, things that, that are, are relatively challenging to mess up. Then there's moderate complexity tests. These are often performed with automated equipment. These are things like electrolyte profiles, chemistry profiles, CBCs, urinalysis, things that, that again, are run on automation, uh, but there is a, an opportunity for, for something to go wrong, and you want to ensure that, that your data is, is reliable and providing um, good information to the clinician, clinician that reviews it. And then finally, you have your high complexity tests. These often require clinical laboratory expertise beyond running automation and may require additional data processing expertise as well. And these are your far more complicated tests, immunohistochemistry, flow cytometry, um, as well as most molecular diagnostics like RT-PCR, microarrays, multiplexed analyses, where you have a, a much more challenging technical environment um, and you're, you're going to have a much higher uh, regulatory burden when if you have this high complexity uh, 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 CLIA certificate. So that was a very high level discussion of regulatory issues. But now I wanna jump into another legal issue uh, and that is intellectual property. So there are kind of, you can view this as two sides to the same coin. There is first obtaining intellectual property protection, which gives um, the, the owner of that protection the ability to, um, to, in, to basically exclude others from using the, the, the same types of technology. And on the other hand, which we'll see on the next slide, there is the, the um, uh, from an intellectual property perspective, there is, the there is the need to ensure that you are reducing your risk profile in terms of potential infringement issues. But first, from an IP protection standpoint, there's really two ways to view this here in the United States. Um, it can be very challenging in, some, in certain areas of, um, 
of diagnostics to obtain IP protection, especially if you're using conventional platforms with previously known or previously published on biomarkers. So if, for example, someone is has a, a new RT-PCR assay for um, the latest COVID uh, variant, but that COVID variant has been published on or, or, or the sequence has been publicly released, it's going to be very challenging in order to, to find uh, to obtain IP protection in those contexts. On the other hand, there is the potential for protection if you are, are developing new platform technologies. So you come up with a new type of assay, there's a hundred different ways you could potentially protect that and gain market advantage in those areas. Um, also improvements to conventional platform technologies. Let's say someone comes up with a, um, a new dye and quencher for uh, a qPCR platform. Those are things that can be protected. There's also the potential to protect biomarkers, but here in the US, there is a, a very important US Supreme Court case um, called Mayo versus Prometheus. It's actually Mayo's clinical laboratory was sued by Prometheus um, and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court where the, the, the court basically made it extremely challenging to protect biomarkers in isolation. You would often need a fair amount of detail in order to, to gain that, that protection for those biomarkers. So um, I, I strongly suggest that, that if you are in a, a leadership position in one of these clinical labs to, to engage early and often with IP counsel in order to, to really grasp these issues. And one other option, and I'll just touch on this because this varies greatly uh, country by country, is the potential option for trade secret protection. Of course, um, that that is a, a big issue for, for those who want to publish, um, but it is a, a potential uh, uh, a potential option for protection. So uh, as I mentioned before, the flip side of actually obtaining IP protection uh, is minimizing your potential patent infringement risk. Because patent infringement, regardless of whether or not you get one patent or 100 patents on your, your diagnostic, be it an IVD or, or an LDT, patent infringement is still a risk. Um, as such, as early as possible in the development process of your assay, again, this applies to both IVDs and LDTs, it is a great idea to engage counsel to conduct what's called a freedom to operate search and a potentially an FTO opinion. So this is basically a, docu a legal document that's prepared by um, an attorney to basically provide um, uh, guidance to an organization in terms of the, the potential infringement issues that are, that are out there. Or if there aren't any, then that's great to know as well. Um, the results of an FTA, FTO search may necessitate the preparation of either a patent invalidity or a patent non-infringement opinion. Again, these are, are, are potential avenues of, of mitigating risk. Even if you are sued, these are ways um, that you could potentially reduce your damages, um, at least here in the United States. Um, this FTO search can actually also work in conjunction with obtaining patent protection in terms of information you might learn while conducting that search. Um, and then the, the search, frankly, might uh, also reveal some bad news in terms of the, the need to in-license one or more patents. Um, and obviously, this is jurisdiction by jurisdiction specific. Uh, we're just talking about the U.S. here. Uh, but those are just some of the, the key um, legal issues that, that crop up uh, um, uh, with different diagnostic assays. Now, with that, I'm going to turn it over back to Mara so she can talk a little bit about um, some COVID-19 specific discussions. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for that excellent summary and uh, following um, Maryland's. And I'm going to take it from there to talk just a little bit about COVID-19. Um, many of us have heard enough about COVID-19, um, but I'm just going to give you a few statistics around that, and then we'll move on to the Q&A. Um, Michael talked about this and the importance of LDTs, in particular as part of the COVID-19 pandemic response and the emergence of something called an EUA. And in many countries around the world, they had the same type of process and authorization as opposed to approval. I think what was very impressive um, with COVID-19 from a testing point of view is that it only took 10 days 
for the first um, genome sequencing to be done on SARS-CoV-2. And just to give you a context, that compares to having it take, taken a month for the last SARS pandemic. So our epidemic didn't quite get to the extent that we have to do with what we have on COVID-19 today. So when we look at that, you're probably familiar with it, but we look at two kinds of tests, the tests that are looking at the virus and looking for the virus elements um, in the genome or the proteins of the virus itself. And then we're also looking at the immune reaction, either with B cells, T cells, or antibodies. We can also look at that immune reaction through systemic um, uh, biometric dynamics, but not really the focus of what we are today. But I think as we look at that, I wanted to give what I'll call the history and the, the past, present, and future of COVID testing in one slide. So when I talk about this, I think it'll give hopefully a, you a very good overview of where we are and where we're going in COVID testing. So it starts with the fact that at the very beginning, it was all about, syst uh, uh, sorry, um, it was all about symptomatic diagnostics, lung CTs and bronchial lavage. It moved from there to active disease diagnosis, PCR and viral, viral antigens. We moved from there to screening testing, which is done worldwide now, individual or pooled PCR. And we know very much the rapid antigen tests but what I think is where we're going today, and in some countries we're already there, it's all going to be about surveillance testing. And what that is, is air quality monitoring, breath tests, COVID sniffing dogs, scratch and sniff, and wastewater. Are they as precise as PCR? They're not, but they can play a very important role from a public health perspective. The second way to think about these tests are where they're being done. They started in hospitals, moved to the central lab, moved from there to point of care, and now um, virtually worldwide, they're all in home or self-tests. But as we do that, where are they being invasive? It started in the lungs, moving to what we call semi-invasive, the nasopharyngeal swabs that go all the way to the back of the nose, then minimally invasive um, with the short anterior nasal, and then to passive and non-invasive. But anytime we look at an industry, it's important to follow the money. And you all know that lab tests have gone from a thousand plus dollars, doing it in US dollars, to a few hundred, to tens of dollars. And I believe before the end of this year, that tests will be broadly available less than $5. We're just beginning to see these rapid antigen tests in the US go below $5. So what are these tests and where have they been and how do the numbers stack up? Well, through a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation as part of something called testingcommons.com, you can look at what we believe are the vast majority of tests available, not just in the US, but around the world. But when you look at this chart, you'll see over 400 FDA EUAs. LDTs, as Michael described, had started at the beginning of the pandemic. We then have the EU self-certification um, of CEIVDs, well more than a thousand. RUO tests in the U.S. not for clinical use. Tests in development that are not being used anywhere, but the new technologies, and I'll describe a little bit about those. And then what's very interesting in the U.S., but also true around the world, the tests that got approvals that got authorizations, but then were revoked. So it's very important um, to emphasize that for our customers. So if we look at that, let me just share um, a few other charts to say in the US, the vast majority of tests that were authorized were molecular tests. And within the molecular test, 86% of them were PCR. Antibody were number two, and antigen a relatively small number of tests, but now being used very broadly. If you look at this in many countries around the world, you will see this antibody number be much higher. But as I mentioned, the FDA has about 85 antibody tests on the market today, but they were more than double that, 170 of those tests 
that had their EUAs revoked. How does that compare to tests in development? Those tests in development, molecular is still number one, but now antigen is number two. And this is the pandemic to date. And what's interesting here, if you look at this molecular area, you remember I said before it was 86% PCR? Now we see much more diversity, only 38% PCR, 23% other molecular with isothermal and 14% um, CRISPR and 13% sequencing, obviously very much related. So we have um, a lot more diversity of the test and development worldwide. I suspect that you'll see many of these tests come to market, but they will not just be COVID, it will be COVID flu A, B, and C, A, A and B, as well as RSV. Lastly, the question we're asked a lot, and I'm sure you're very familiar with it, is the SARS-CoV-2 variants. I ask five questions. When we look at these variants, does it make the test less accurate? And to date, the answer is no. And as a laboratory industry, we need to continue to publish and have the data available that our tests are working, whether in the lab, molecular, other tests, that the tests are still accurate with different variants. Clearly, we have to check that, but important. Does it increase cases and deaths? We know that. Does it make some treatments ineffective? It does. Vaccine effectiveness is a tricky area. We won't go into detail on that or raise the hurdle on herd immunity, but we know that variants are really what it's about. So to summarize and to end, I'd like to provide a little bit of perspective on the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic. And what you see here is a chart that looks at case fatality rate versus r not or transmissibility or infectiousness. And as we look at that, you can see that there are diseases going back for a very long time as we looked at the plague that had a tremendous case fatality rate, um, rabies at 100% of untreated. But in uh, many of these, you see TB and other infectious diseases that were highly fatal. However, they were not easily spread. The dangerous ones are the ones um, that are both highly infectious and highly transmissible. Happily, there's nothing in that box. But what you see is if you move from COVID Wuhan um, to Delta to Omicron, you see it's becoming less deadly, partly because of herd immunity, but it's also becoming more and more contagious. So I wanted to give that historical perspective and hopefully we will see COVID continue to go down in this chart. So to summarize the great work that um, Marilyn and Michael talked about today, LDTs and IVDs are central to patient care. Their LDTs are an important locus of diagnostic innovation. They leverage a regulatory system that has the ability to quickly adapt, and they're tied to laboratory processes where IVDs are tied to laboratory tests. So with that, I'd like to... Um, ask Marilyn and Michael to come back on screen, and we're going to take uh, questions from the audience. Welcome back. It is great to see you. And I'm going to start with our first question. We have about 15 minutes. And the first question um, is, is a new one to us, which is, I think this, Marilyn, goes to you. What if there are no other labs running a similar test to the LDT, the novel test for comparison or concordance? How does a lab perform the clinical validation procedures? That, that's an excellent question, uh, because if you're the first to do it, then you have to do more of an analytical validation proof with a, a test group of clinical patients. That means you work very closely with the physician groups. And the test that you have designed for a patient population, you really need to have the kind of before, during, and after picture of the patients you're testing. So it's a lot more documentation. It's still possible. But what you need to do, obviously, is to impress the physicians to using the test that it is worth using. And using it on their patients is generally the best way to do that. 
Thank you, Marilyn. Our next, um, and as you said, very important question. Our next question, I think, Michael, goes to you. Um, we talked a lot about the various different types of clinical diagnostics. Where do RUO assays fit in? Can they be used as clinical diagnostics or not? Well, they they can, but they they aren't used uh, under the IVD heading. Um, so, I mean, it, it again, depending on on the the, the laboratory and the laboratory's um, CLIA certificate, um, some of those RUOs can actually be deployed as LDTs. Um, and in fact, some uh, analyte specific reagent manufacturers, ASR manufacturers, um, will sell uh, RUO type uh, kits to be used in, in that LDT process or in that, yeah, in the LDT process for, it, for your clinical diagnostics. And, and I should clarify, RUO though is research use mm -hmm. only. Yes. So they have to be reported differently than a classic clinical diagnostic? Well, no, it would still be part of a, 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 an LDT. Um, I mean, all the steps that Marilyn discussed in terms of launching an LDT would still have to be undertaken. Um, it's not one of those those kind of ready to wear type assays like yeah. you would run into with a with a with an IBD. Um, so you would still have to go through to perform your your validation uh, steps, but it is something that that could be done um, in the, in a lab that is properly certified. Super, thank you, uh, Marilyn. Next one to you. Um, you've had so much experience. How long generally does it take for your lab? A lab to develop a molecular diagnostic before making it be, you know, go live and available for patients. Well, how long is a function of a lot of things? Um, the type of test, if it's a PCR test, obviously that would, would take a different amount of time than if you were trying to do an ELISA. And if you had a patient population that you were really targeting, can you get samples of patients? Because that's going to be your limiting factor. So I would say that in general, if you have a dedicated team or tech or department to develop LDTs, you're probably looking at two to three months to develop them. If you're doing it part-time with available talent, <laughs> It may take you six months. And related to that, Marilyn, so thank you. Is there a minimum number of samples required for the clinical validation as part of the assay development? Uh, there are lots of guidelines that give recommendations for the numbers of samples. I think the CLSI is probably the best resource because they have a number of publications of various technologies, for example, nucleic acid testing, ELISA testing, clinical chemistry testing, and they will give you guidelines for how many samples you need to use for both analytical validations as well as clinical. If you go to the quick and dirty least uh, number. <laughs> uh, in the U.S., the New York State will uh, is one of the agencies that actually will review LDTs and will grant the approval for them to be used on New York State patients. They use uh, a number of around 30 as the number that they would like to see in the LDTs. Now, obviously, multiplexing makes it a little more challenging because you have to be able to uh, ensure that you don't have cross-reactivity or interference, but uh, between 20 and 30 uh, positive cases, and then of course, an equal number of negative ones would be the minimum. Thank you. And that was consistent with the EUAs for COVID where I believe it was 30 positive and negative cases. Um, Michael, right. I think this is to you. Um, could LDT validated data become IVD data for an FDA application? Um, I mean, it depends on whether or not it is, it, it, that data itself would be considered um, clinical trial worthy data. I mean, if it is, I mean, obviously if the LDT has been 
been validated, that's that's great. That's a that's a big benefit. But it, that is something that could um, lend credence. And conversely, there are actually obligations to submit um, uh, kind of all information to the FDA. So if your LDT is not working out real well, um, you you might also also and you and that's what you want to push forward for an IVD. Um, that's something that that could also kind of kind of backfire as well. Um, that being said, I mean you also have to re remember who's running an LDT and who's menu, who, uh, who would be a sponsor for an IVD application. I mean, a sponsor for an IVD application is going to be a manufacturer and a, a clinical laboratory is going to be the one that's, that's, that's um, developing, validating and deploying a, an LDT. There are, there's not often going to be a lot of overlap there because the clinical laboratory has a very different focus uh, than, than uh, IVD manufacturer as well. Super. Thank you for that and giving the additional context there. Marilyn, this harkens back to some of what you talked about. If somebody has validated a custom panel, what should they do when they're deciding to add more targets or more pathogens to that existing panel? How difficult a process is that? It depends on whether it's a panel of individual uh, PCRs or whether you have a multiplexed panel, because in either case, you're going to have to revalidate, but the extent, extent that you have to revalidate is different for those, because if you are uh, mixing reagents, you have to prove that you haven't interfered with anything by adding a new one. But if you've simply added a new PCR marker separately, all you have to do is run a few clinical samples and prove that it may, that it works, that it makes sense. And then related to that, I, I think we know the answer, but does an LDT need to compare with an existing method for validation? If, if there is one, yes. Uh, and if there isn't, as I said, you have to kind of do your own clinical uh, validation. Right. So I think the easiest way is to make sure that you have uh, physicians with patients lined up so that if need be, you can go directly into the patient samples. That's actually a great point uh, about those patient samples and physicians lined up. Michael, from a legal point of view, what are the concerns and issues that a lab needs to think about as they're going through that process, permissions and, and otherwise? Yeah, no, I mean, I think permission is going to be a huge issue. Um, I mean, especially if the the clinical laboratory ever wants to publish any of this data, which can, um, from a U.S. perspective, can can kind of feed into a reimbursement question. Um, I mean, I think permission is, is what's going to be key at that point. Um, is that sample... Um, is the laboratory ever going to do anything with that sample um, that that would run afoul of the wishes of the the person from which it originated? Um, and obviously, there's also issues tied into um, uh, can the laboratory retain part of that sample? Because um, I mean, that's one of the ways that that you can um, uh, check kind of laboratory and um, uh, competency to continue doing competency testing is by testing samples that are no negatives and positives. Um, and those, if those are clinical mm -hmm. samples, you need that level of permission in order to kind of hold on to that sample as well. That's actually a great point, Michael, that you bring up um, proficiency testing. Are there any guidelines that labs can refer to if they're not in a network that has an automatic system for proficiency testing? Is that you, Marilyn? Oh, well, I'd say contact uh, CAP first, since they do have a proficiency testing program. And if they don't have their own guidelines, which I believe they do have, they could certainly point you in the direction of what guidelines they follow. Super. And CAP is the College of American Pathology. Um, but despite the having American in the name, it uh, operates worldwide and is That's something right. that many, many labs outside of the U.S. have CAP, it's often called CAP certification. 
So thank you for that. Um, let me ask that another question, skipping a little bit around not necessarily a molecular diagnostic, but we had questions about flow cytometry and other sort of clinical chemistry tests. How do LDT tests overlap with something like flow cytometry? Uh, that's a rough one because flow cytometry is more a technology. Right. And if you're going to add reagents to that technology, then you have to be absolutely certain your reagents are appropriate. So it's hard to say it would be an LDT because many of those are either monoclonal antibodies or specific protein binding uh, that it's unlikely an LDT would create. Uh, Michael, what do you think about that? No, I mean, I, I agree. It's, I, it, if I think oftentimes your flow cytometry reagents, if it is going to be a, a diagnostic assay, it's probably going to be more on the IVD side of things, um, just by the, the nature of, of what is being supplied. That's like um, almost saying, uh, asking about a PCR machine. So, I mean, your, your, your PCR machine itself might, might be uh, cleared as a medical device depending on, on kind of what it's being used for. But then on top of that, you, you've got the actual reagents that are being used. Super, so those ASRs. Well, we just have time for two quick additional questions. One's not easy, but um, what is the difference, Marilyn, between a CLIA and a CAP certification? Because people hear that all the time, CLIA and CAP. Oh, okay. Uh, well, the CLIA is actually the U.S. government's uh, authorization of a clinical laboratory license, whereas CAP is an elective one where you apply to the college to also be inspected and certified by them. But you have to have CLIA first. Thank you for that, Marilyn. And they're both kind of difficult to, to get through, so you have to be prepared. Um, and speaking of prepared, last question, then I'll hand it back over to Claire. But um, a question about, I don't have enough manpower. If a lab doesn't have enough manpower for validation, can Thermo Fisher cover validation? So I'm going to I'm going to hand that over to you, Claire, to both answer and then wrap us up. But I'm going to say thank you for all the great questions and our terrific presentations from Dr. Owens and Dr. Donovan, um, it's been a pleasure to join you and to be with you today. Thank you very much, uh, Mara, Marilyn, and Michael for your time today and your informative presentation. And let me uh, answer the last quick question first. So yes, Thermo Fisher can uh, provide, and we do provide the analytical validation services. Um, and um, in terms of the clinical validation services, we can help you to engage with some of the, the local uh, uh, vendors that can um, support you further on that. So for any more details, uh, you can always reach out to your um, corresponding sales rep for more uh, information about those. So with that, uh, I know uh, we're at time, but before we go, I would like to thank all the audience for joining us today and for their interest question, interesting questions. And questions um, we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period, we will definitely uh, address those by the, uh, definitely by the speakers and via the contact information that you provided um, at the time that you did the uh, registration. And so lastly, I would like to remind you all that um, there are a few resources available for you to download. And what's being covered by our speakers today um, could also be found in those education papers. And there's also more detailed information that you can find there. And this webcast can be viewed on demand Lab Roots will also alert you via email when it's available for a replay. And we definitely encourage you to share the email with your colleagues who have uh, missed today's uh, events. So until next time, uh, goodbye to you all and thank you again for all our speakers. Bye.